Hello everyone, this is Jono, and welcome to the 30th Hearthstone Weekly Show, another landmark I randomly hit in the same week. It's a little odd to hit this many landmarks in one week, but whatever. Anyway, so for this weekly, as I said, I was going to take the two most popular decks from the last video I did, which was the top 10 decks that I was expecting out of this format, and the two most popular were Warlock, Shields Up, and rogue cantrip so i'm going to be doing those two today and then next week probably on either wednesday or thursday i haven't decided yet i'm going to be releasing less sort of detailed but still fairly structured ones on three different decks which are the three next most popular we had warrior legendaries paladin giants and druid beatdown so i'm going to be doing those three decks but today I'm going to be doing Cantrip Rogue and Warlock Shields Up. Now the chat is freaking out a bit at the moment, so if I miss any uh, questions I apologize, there's not much I can do, Twitch is messing up. So I hope that this video doesn't go up late because of Twitch, but it might, but I hope not. But anyway, without further ado, let's get started shall we? Now the first one I'm going to be going over is Warlock Shields Up, which has been a very popular Warlock deck. It's been hyped to be one of the best decks in the format. A lot of streamers are playing it. A lot of people in Legend are playing it at the moment. So, first things first, let's look at where it gets the name from. The Shields Up engine. Now, the Shields Up engine is a very defensive engine powered by defensive creatures with some Fury Protectors and Defender of Argus. It was originally involved in Priest, but then moved over to Warlock because they have a couple of other things they can add to it that Priest can't, as we'll go over in the next uh, next couple minutes. But anyway, so, the actual core of the engine. We have Sun Fury Protector and Defender of Argus. These are your enablers for the actual engine. We've got two different ways of giving your defensive creatures taunt. Now, Sun Fury Protector is cheaper, but it only gives taunt. It's cheaper, has the same body, now that Defender of Argus got nerfed a bit, but it only gives taunt. Defender of Argus, you're paying two extra mana to give both creatures plus one plus one. So, earlier on in the game, you can give things taunt for very, very low cost. Later on in the game, you can buff them up as well as giving them the taunt affix, which is one of the reasons why it's such a powerful card. So let's look at what kind of things you're going to be using these taunts on. Now the first two cards I'm going to talk about are Ancient Watcher and Twilight Drake. Ancient Watcher is used in a lot of Shields Up decks because it's highly, highly tanky. Comes down really early. If you give it taunt, aggro decks just can't get over it. Twilight Drake, however, is one of the three cards that Warlock Shields Up decks can run in the engine. Why? Because Warlock has that life tap ability which lets them keep their hand size high so it keeps the health on the Twilight Drake incredibly high. You'll see 8 health, 9 health, 10 health Twilight Drakes at times and if you give it taunt with say Defender of Argus it becomes a 5-11 is the largest I've seen at least from Twilight Drake. It becomes incredibly large, essentially an Ancient of War, very powerful to add to this kind of Shields Up deck. The other two parts of the Shields Up engine which we're going to see from Warlock Shields Up decks are the Giants. Now there's something else that some of the other Shields Up decks can't run because they don't have a way of feasibly lowering their life if they're winning and they don't have a way of keeping their hand as high in terms of reducing the cost for a Mountain Giant. In fact, one of the reasons why some people refer to this deck as just Big Hand Lock, which I personally think is a horrible name, but uh, some people do refer to it as that is because of the Twilight Drake and the Mountain Giant, where you get them out earlier because you have a lot of card draw and serves some serious taunt targets with things like Defender of Argus and Sun Fury Protector. Mountain Giant serves as a free way of getting back into the game against aggro decks. So later on in the game, you get burst down a bit, and you have generally one turn to recover. If you go Mountain Giant, Sun Fury Protector, they're not killing you. They need an Assassinate or... Black Knight, or Naturalize, or something of that kind. They can't just burst you down like they would be able to normally, because Molten Giants are so tanky. So, that is the Shields Up engine. That's where it gets the name from, and that's one of the reasons why 
this particular variant of Shields Up is so powerful because it adds those Twilight Drakes and those Giants along with the uh, Ancient Watchers with the Sun Fury Protectors and Defender of Argus. It's one of the reasons why it's such a powerful variant. It's just because it adds things that are very difficult to deal with. Another comment about the Giants is they are very difficult to deal with with things like Druid because Druid revolves a lot around bursting large creatures down and getting through 8 health or 9 health in a Giant is much harder than it seems. Now, we'll go over to some of the other essential cards, which a lot of these decks have been playing. This one will be about the three drops, and then we'll see some of the late game and some of the spells that they run. Now, as far as the three drops goes, three drop, in my mind, is the most important slot for mana cost. Three drops are the bridge between the very fast aggro decks and the mid-range to control decks where depending on your selection of three drops it shows how fast your deck is how much tempo game you're going for things like that so the two three drops that this deck is basically fueled on early game is harvest golem and earthring farseer harvest golem is an aggro stop it just two for one's aggro decks all the time it's very difficult to burst through a harvest golem without it taking two three i've even seen four minions dying to this thing if you're playing a swarm archetype other thing is that if you buff a Harvest Golem and give it Taunt with Defender of Argus, it becomes a 3-4 that comes back as a 2-1. It's a very, very good Defender of Argus buff target. Now, the second 3-drop here is Earthen Ring Farseer. Earthen Ring Farseer serves as a way of playing your Molten Giants and then healing yourself back out of burn range, especially against things like Mages. The other thing it allows you to do is heal up your Giants if they're trying to wear them down over several turns, and it lets you get a couple more deck sort of hits in with the giants which can often mean the difference between winning and losing taking eight life off per hit is a huge amount and will end the game very quickly and if you keep those kinds of creatures alive then the opponent will just not be able to deal with them at all it's the same principle with aggro decks if you heal up your giants they can't get through it and druids have to burst it down a lot and they have to go for it in one turn but the primary use of the Earthen Ring Forest here is to heal yourself back up after you've played your Molten Giants. Now, one of the interesting things about the two essential spells that they've been running a lot is that Siphon Soul heals yourself back up once you've been playing Molten Giants, and Hellfire reduces your health so that you can play Molten Giants. Hellfire is primarily used as an AoE and burst damage, however it can be used to heal, to sort of manipulate your health. This kind of deck has no issue with manipulating its health in slower matchups, it can lower it and increase it whenever it wants to, with life taps and Hellfire, and then on the other end you have Earthen Forcers and Siphon Souls. But the second, that's the secondary function of these cards, is to manipulate your health total for things like Molten Giants. The primary sort of function is Hellfire deals with a lot of these aggro decks that this deck has a lot of problems with, things like Murlocs, Warlock aggro variants, some of the Mage aggro variants, even some Cantrip variants, has some serious issues with, and Hellfire helped a lot when that, uh, when that kind of thing, especially considering these kind of decks play very greedily for the first couple turns. You need to life tap almost every turn on the first couple so you can get a Giant or a Twilight Drake out. So you need that Hellfire to clear the board while you're setting yourself up in terms of your hand size, getting down these large creatures. And Siphon Soul is just an incredible card. It works in the mirror match, where you just take out a giant and then you gain three life. It helps against things like Ancient of War, Ragnaros, really game-ending cards. You can even use it on things like Alex Straza against Warriors. I've seen this used against Deathwing. Baron Geddon. This is all stuff that's relevant from the Warrior Legendaries matchup. And against Rogue Cantrip, you can use it on Sylvanas, Black Knight, things like that. Very useful card, heals yourself back up, deals with a threat, essentially skips your opponent's turn, and while you're skipping your turn, you gain a small advantage out of it because you're gaining three life. It's a really nice card, really sort of it's been underestimated for for a while now. But it has been really, really good. So anyway, moving on to the last essential card in my mind. The last essential card is Lord Jaraxxus. Now, Lord Jaraxxus is the deck's win condition if it's being stalled out. 
it has two win conditions. One is buff giants, and two is Jiraxis. Now, they're both here for different reasons. Buffed giants work against some decks, but against some other decks, they just fight through your giants. Things like Cantrip Rogue, Druid Beatdown, and Warrior Legendaries can fight through the giants. They will... It will take a while, but if they have the correct draw, they will fight through those giants and still kill you. Lord Jiraxis, if you have a turn to play, which the giant combo will give you a turn, you play it for a turn, remove a creature, and then just play 6-6s six every single turn and eventually end the game. Now, the reason why Lord Jiraxis isn't the only win condition in this deck is because it has a fatal weakness to burst damage. Against things like Mage, you can't just play Jiraxis because you will get burst to death. You need to play Jaraxxus against Mage to heal yourself back up, so you can't use it as a win condition as much because you need to use it as a heal. So between those two, however, and the other health manipulation in the deck, you can essentially fight through most different kinds of decks. It's the Giants, the health manipulation, and Jaraxxus which gives it sort of wide range of matchups that it's good against, and it's why it's one of the best decks in the format. So anyway. Now let's move on to the skeleton list. Now, this is what is essential in the deck. So if we look at the skeleton list, we have Draxus, Giants, one to two mountain giants. Now, a lot of people run one giant in, in this category because they don't need all four giants. Some people run two. It depends how strong your matchups are against some of the late game decks and some of the early game decks, how much tempo loss it is to play Mountain Giants, sometimes if it's dead in your hand. It's debatable. A lot of the top ones have been running one, and but some of them have also been running two. Now, Ancient Watcher, Defender of Argus, Sun Fury, two offs. It's part of the engine. Twilight Drake, one to two, for the same reason as Mountain Giant. Earthen Ring Farsi or Harvest Golem, two offs, essential for early game. Now, the interesting ones here are we have two pairs. We have one to two Hellfires and one to two Shadow Flame. Now, some decks run two copies of each. Some run one of one and two of the other. The point is, it's a combination. You have a minimum of two AoEs, maximum of four. Tinker around with it, see which combination you prefer. Some people run two Shadow Flames, no Hellfires. It's debatable. A lot of them do run all four, though, just to be safe. But with less aggro around, all four might not be as necessary. Now the other ones we have is Siphon Soul and Shadow Ult, which is just solid removal. And the interesting ones is Soul Fire. It's only a one of. You can't play two because it discards too many important things. But playing one can sometimes do things that no other removal spell can because it costs zero. The other one is Mortal Coil. You can play one between one and two. It's sometimes good, sometimes not. It, it's debatable. Now the other one that a lot of these decks have been running, which I actually didn't put in the uh, the text or skeleton list, partly because I forgot. Again, random typo. It's kind of essential in, uh, in many of my videos, but um, it's RMB Cal. Now, RMB Cal wasn't run in the Warlock Shields up deck that recently made a top four, but a lot of them have been running it, and the main reason is it costs almost nothing, and you're always drawing cards, so the fact that it doesn't have a large body on it is irrelevant, and it also helps with Mortal Coil to deal with things like Twilight Drakes in the Mirror or Defender of Argus buffs, things like that. However, Iron B. Cal is something which is very personal preference, so I'm going to leave it up to you. A lot of people run two, some people run one, but as I said, it wasn't in the, the last deck that actually made top four. So anyway, between all that, we have a mix of between two to five free card slots. So what are some of the techs you can run to fill these two to five free card slots? Now, the first one here is the mid-game. We have Sylvanas, which was recently nerfed to 6 mana, but is still incredibly relevant, and Black Knight. Now, these function a very similar role. Sylvanas is used to punch through a lot of the very, very large minions and then steal something. It's also an aggro stop, because they have to start trading with the Sylvanas. They can't just keep attacking some of your other stuff, because then the border get weakened and it's a 5-5. And it's a really good anti-druid and warlock card. 
the main reason for this, and this is one of the reasons why there's been so much silence run with R&B Cows and Warlock and Keeper of the Groves, is Sylvanas. If you don't silence that thing, it will steal a Giant or an Ancient O' War or a Ragnaros. These are really game-ending steals that can happen. If you play Sylvanas and your opponent ends their turn with a Ragnaros on the board, and they hit the Sylvanas, it's a nightmare. Because they'll just lose their Ragnaros or anything else large on their field, and you get massive value out of your Sylvanas. That's why the card is so powerful, the effect is insane, and the body is actually incredibly relevant at 5-5. Now, the other card here is the Black Knight. The Black Knight varies from being horrible and incredibly overpowered, depending on your metagame. Now, in this situation, we've got Shields Up decks, we've got Defender of Argus in almost every deck, and we have Ancient of Wars being played in some situations, Druid of the Claws, Scenarius even, there's a lot of active hits for the Black Knight in the current metagame. A massive amount of active hits. Against some decks, it's practically useless, which is why it's sided out a lot of the time. In tournaments, it's like MLG, but it's an incredible card. Now, some Warlock players don't run it because they have two Siphon Souls and they have other removal, but it's a massive tempo gain, and you can even buff it. If you put Defender of Argus on this thing, it becomes a 5-6 with Taunt. That's a rather large body. It's not quite a giant, but it's pretty close. And that is also a giant, which killed something. So the Black Knight is debatable. I would definitely test it. A lot of people do have Black Knight from other decks, but I would definitely test it in this kind of deck if it's the kind of deck you want to go for. Now, the next two I'm going to be talking about are the late game booster cards. We've got Twisting Nether and Alexstrasza. Now, Twisting Nether is one that was run in the in the recent deck because late game, it just provides you a sort of stop to your opponent's advantage. If you ever get behind late game and you play Twisting Nether, you reset the game. And often your opponent does not have the correct minions to play and get board position back, whereas you can start playing your cheaper removal and giants and things like that. So it's just a reset to the game, and often you can actually twist together, and then if you're low enough on life, you can play a mount, play a molten giant or even a mountain giant in some situations. So it's a rather interesting card. I I'm not sure whether it should be in all these decks, but I think it's something which you should definitely test. A lot of people have been running it, and a lot of people like it. But then some of the other people who have been running this kind of deck think it's a little too slow, and I tend to agree with them to some some respect, so I'm not sure. I think Twisting is a very interesting tech card that can be run, but the real question is, is it worth going to deck as a staple? And Jesus, another typo! Why? Ah, uh, two typos in one episode. That's actually a record. Anyway, the other card I was going to talk about is Alex Straza. Now, Alex Straza is another HP reset, but it's a bit more complicated than just an HP reset for you. What Alex Straza does is it effectively reduces your opponent's health down to 15 or increases yours to 15. And you think, wait a second, Jolly, that's what it says on the card. Of course it does that. Yes, but it's something to actually think about. And the main reason for that is, if you, repu- if you reduce your opponent's health to 15, they are dead in two hits. I mean, think about it. You've got, at that point, four cards that have eight attack. And those are your main sort of offense. So 15 health is practically nothing. It's just two hits from any of your major aggressive win conditions. And then, in your case, you can heal yourself back up to 15 and not lock yourself out of Molten Giants. This is something which Jaraxxus does, which Alexstrasza doesn't, which is lock yourself out of Molten Giants, because Jaraxxus makes your maximum health 15, which means that Molten Giants can never be played, basically. You need to be on 5 health to play a uh, Molten Giant for 10 mana. You complete yourself. You completely lock yourself out of two of your main win conditions by playing Jaraxxus, which he sort of makes up for by the fact that he makes six sixes every single turn. But Alex Straza doesn't lock yourself out of that, which is important. He just sets your 
remaining life to 15 and you can still play your molten giants for five cost each and it still works so alexstrasza is something which a lot of these sort of decks have been running because it's a second hp reset and it helps a lot against these burst decks and just doesn't lock yourself out of molten giants and it also serves as a massive win condition two hits is all you need once you play an alexstrasza now the other things which some people have been running is ways of ending the game out of nowhere, along with Soulfire. Now it may contradict what you think the actual deck should do, which is playing defensively and just wearing your opponent down, however sometimes just one or two extra cards will just end the game. So Leroy Jenkins and Power of Whelming function incredibly similarly, they just have a bit of reach on them, Leroy Jenkins, the downside basically never comes up because you use it as a finisher and it's a six damage fireball. It's just a fireball. It's a minion based fireball. And often that's enough to win the game. Just Leroy bursting through one taunt and then hitting them in the face for eight from a giant. And the same with Power of Whelming. The other synergy with Power of Whelming is Shadow Flame. In fact, it's synergy with both. Both Leroy and Power of Whelming can be Shadow Flamed because they give a massive attack boost and they cost almost nothing compared to some of the other stuff in the deck. So both of these cards function just as finishers, burst damage, and shadow flame power. That's about all to say about them in this particular deck. They just reach for end of the game. They help a lot with Alexstrasza as well if you decide to run that tech because you can just do 10 damage with both cards here. Just do 10 plus Alexstrasza, they are beyond dead. So Leroy, Power of Whelming, interesting to run maybe one copy of Power of Whelming, especially I wouldn't run two, but they are interesting decks. So the other deck that a lot of people asked for was Rogue Cantrip. Now upon writing sort of uh, the slides and such for this kind of thing, I realized that Rogue Cantrip is not as easy to write an essential guide to because there's so many variants to it there's hundreds of different variants to rogue cantrip don't even try and expect that there's there's only a couple that you can run so even some of the cards in the engine and the essential cards are not two ofs they're debatably one or two copies or interchangeable in some of the cantrips or things like that it's very interesting so moving on to the the first one is the cantrip engine loot hoarder and novice engineer this is what I mean. Novice Engineer was an essential 2 of. Now it's a 1-1, one, one, so it's interchangeable with another cantrip spell, which I'm going to go over later, called Shiv. And they're interchangeable. You don't tend to run both. You can, but mostly you run two copies of either Novice Engineer or Shiv, combined. But anyway, so both of these cards function as early stops to aggro and help in general when it comes to smoothing out your draws and just functioning as pressure in the case of Loot Hoarder. So if you play Loot Hoarder and your opponent has to deal with it in some way, say hero powering, if they hero power your Loot Hoarder, then you both skip your turns, you draw a card, so you both have the same hand size, but the difference is you see an extra card. And thinning out your deck is actually, while a lot of people do underestimate it, and if you actually do the math on it, you need to do it three or four times before it makes a substantial difference, Cantrip decks will run probably six, seven cantrips, so you do thin your deck out quite a lot, and you just see an extra card. It's seeing the extra card that matters the most, and the fact that your opponent also had to be disrupted in his tempo while dealing with it is quite essential. Now, the other one here is Novice Engineer. Now, Novice Engineer got nerfed. It used to be a 1-2, and it was incredible. It was one of the best cards I... It, it was one of the best cards in the game. It just was. It got nerfed. It's now a 1-1, which makes it a little sketchy. You can still deal with it with a hero power now, and it makes it just a wor worse loot order in most respects. The difference is that Novice Engineer has a battle cry, not a death rattle, which means you see the card first. It means it can't be silenced. Late game, if you top deck it, you just play it straight down. You don't have to worry about waiting for the card to do anything. It just gets you a card. Maybe you might draw into the answer. And so as a result, while I do think Loot Hoarder is arguably better now because it's more offensive and they do almost the same thing, 
I do think that Novice Engineer is being underestimated and might be played still as a one-off in these kinds of decks, whereas before it was sometimes being one Loot Hoarder, two Novice, it might be two Loot Hoarder, one Novice. But the cards are still essential in the Cantrip Engine. Now, onto another section of the Cantrip Engine. This is the Spell Damage Cantrip Area. We have two cards, Blood Mage, Thalnos, and Azure Drake. Blood Mage is arguably the most powerful Cantrip Minion in the game because it has the Loot Hoarder effect, the, the Loot Hoarder effect in Death Rattle. However, it also gives spell damage. The spell damage is not to be underestimated. It can power up your shivs, your backstabs for free, your eviscerates to five, which kills things like Senjin. It can buff up Fan of Knives, Blade Flurry, all the incredibly essential spells in these kinds of decks are damage based, which means spell damage is incredible in these kinds of decks. It just buffs up every single spell you have access to, every single removal spell you have access to, apart from arguably a one of Assassinate, but then Assassinate isn't always played. Some people play it, it isn't always played. But besides that, all the removal is damage based. So spell damage is a massive, massive function in this deck. The other spell damage minion is Azure Drake. Now, the difference is Azure Drake has the novice engineer effect of drawing a card when it's played. It loses the same amount of stats as Blood Mage does roughly for its, uh, for its cost, has spell damage as well, but the battle cry being draw a card is much more useful than death rattle in our, in most situations. The 4-4 four, four body is also much more useful than the 1-1, one, one, but the reason why Azure Drake isn't as mandatory as Blood Mage is in most of these decks is because of the cost. Now, spell damage functions the best when you can use it as a surprise tactic and then combo off a bunch of spells afterwards. Not to mention having low cost function as a better combo starter for things like Eviscerates. But the 4-4 body does make up for most of these weak points and it is still one of the strongest cantrip minions in the game and will be played in most of these decks nowadays. But anyway, so that's the cantrip minions. Now, the rest of the Cantrip Engine is spells. We've got Shiv, which more or less at the moment is functioning as a substitute to Novice Engineer or a mix of Shiv and Novice Engineer, depending on the kind of style you're going for, whether it's more spell damage focused or more buff focused. And the other one's Fan of Knives, which is being as a substitute or in combination with Blade Flurry. As I said, it's very difficult to make a comprehensive deck breakdown of Cantrip because it's so flexible. <laughs> but Shiv, now what does Shiv do? It essentially functions as a hero power that benefits from spell damage. But you also get to see an extra card. The other sort of noticeable thing about this is that it's not tauntable. So it functions just as a better hero power most of the time. And you don't take any damage. So the other comparable card this is to is Wrath. Now, Wrath is often used instead of a hero power so you can dig in if your hand is pretty awful. Shiv functions is the same thing. It smooths out your draws. Sometimes you even use it on the, the enemy hero when you really need to draw into something or if you have a bunch of floating mana. You really need to use Shiv just to smooth out your draws and just get the answers you need. Same function as Novice Engineer, but it just benefits the different things. Fan of Knives, however, is a card that's been dropped a bunch recently in favor for all Blade Flurry, but is still a viable option, especially if you need a couple of extra cantrips. Now, the one damage AoE is pretty horrible, I must admit, as a one damage. However, it benefits from spell damage, making it two or three possibly, which is very respectable. And it also draws a card, which means it replaces itself and it digs you further into the deck, keeping your hand size as large as it possibly can. Because when you play something that says draw a card and you use your entire turn for that and get a couple of value, sort of valuable kills out of it, or just value in general, then it's very noticeable because you drew a card you then played a card and then drew a card of that, which means your hand actually increased in size as opposed to sort of staying even, which is what it normally would have. That's why Cantrip is so powerful in general as a mechanic, and that's why there's a deck based around it. Now, moving on to some of the essential cards. Now, these are separated into a couple of uh, different categories. First one is the weapon engine. We have Deadly Poison and Blade Flurry. As I said, Blade Flurry is interchangeable with uh, Fan of Knives, but Deadly Poison is almost essential. Along with the hero power, it gives you a fiery war axe, essentially, which is 
incredible. A fiery war axe will deal with a lot of different things and just the ability to use that as one mana combo starter, well, the actual combo needs three mana. Sometimes you can just use it as a combo starter for some of the other essential cards like SI7 Agent or Eviscerate. And on top of that, we have Blade Flurry, which benefits massively from Deadly Poison. This is one of the reasons why Blade Flurry is often played over Fan of Knives, is because of its massive interaction with Deadly Poison. Deadly Poison functions as essentially a double spell damage for Blade Flurry. And as I said before, while the combo fully takes 5 mana, the combo, if you already have a dagger, it takes 3. And you can also deal an extra 3 to something if you have the durability to spend. Which means that you can attack the enemy hero for 3, Blade Flurry for 3, destroy your dagger, and then deal 3 to everything. So you deal 6 to the opponent and 3 to everything else without taking any damage. Massive damage combo, quite widely underestimated by a lot of non-rogue players, but it's devastating once you actually see it. Now, some of the other essential cards are the buff engine, which is used on a cantrip minions to make up for their lack of stats. Now, the buff engine got nerfed slightly, being the Defender of Argus got nerfed a bit, and Dark Iron isn't permanent, but Dark Iron's nerf was not really a nerf for this kind of deck. It's a bit complicated. Dark Iron Dwarf's nerf affected things like Argent Squire quite massively because it's not permanent anymore. You don't just keep a 3-1 after it trades with something. However, in this kind of deck, it allows you to play two of them now if you really want to because it's no longer a dead draw if you don't have any board position. Because what was happening pre-patch is that it was a dead draw. So you played it and then buffed your opponent's minion and then they traded with the Dark Iron Dwarf. <laughs> it was not a good card to play on an empty board before, whereas now you can play on an empty board as a 4 mana 4-4, four, four, and it shouldn't really be underestimated in that regard. Defender of Argus, the actual attack nerf is practically non-existent because it's the buff that was the most important thing about the card. This can target novice engineers, loot hoarders, blood mage, azure drakes to give large amounts of stat bonuses, other dark irons, harvest golems, si7s. There's lots of good buff targets for Defender of Argus, gets you over some of those key thresholds for removal, like buffing a 3-3 into a 4-4 gets it over things like Frostball and Wrath, and buffing a 4-4 into 5-5 gets over things like Swipe, and spell damage on some of the three damage removal and things like that. It's actually fairly essential as far as buff goes. Any health based buff is very useful. The damage is sort of an extra bonus but the health based buff is one of the most important things about the card and that's why it's played so much. Now the other things I'm going to go over as I did before was the essential three drops. Harvest Golem shows here again for the same reasons where you can use it as an aggro stop, it trades very efficiently, gives you some extra card advantage because they have to use extra cards on it. But there's one extra role to this which is as an offensive force. It can be used to get three damage in with defenders or four damage in with dark irons and just pick off anything that your opponent tries to get the board position back with. Now the other 3-drop here is SI7, which is arguably one of the best 3-drops in the game. Now, the combo 2 damage is an incredible combo, it's a free backstab. Now if you coin this out, you get a comboed SI7 on turn 2, which will deal with pretty much any 2-drop that they have played, and give you a 3-3. It's one of the strongest openings you can possibly do. Late game, however, you can backstab to combo it, you can play a cantrip minion to combo it, deadly poison to combo it, there's a lot of cheap combo spells you can play to get that combo sort of activate on the SI7 and deal that 2 damage for free. So moving on to the skeleton list, we have the standard cantrip core, we've got blood mage, azure drake as a 1 or 2 because it can be kind of slow. But if you notice the rest of them, there's a lot of variants. There aren't that many two offs that are essential. We've got one to two Azure Drake because of tempo, one to two Defender because sometimes it's a bit dead in your hand if you don't have two targets for it, one to two Knife Juggler. Now this is something which I didn't mention in the essential cards because it's not always that essential. But it is a very, very good early drop and it's been played by a lot of successful counter decks to the point when I feel like it should be on the skeleton list, at least as a one-off. 
Now, the thing it synergizes with is once to defy us. I wouldn't run two knife juggler, two defy us. I would probably run two of one of them and one of the other. Because defy us is pretty bad if you're going first. Whereas knife juggler can be good if you're going first or second, but then it's less sort of explosive. Then defy us if you're going second, so it's a bit debatable. I personally prefer two knife juggler, one defy us, but it's personal preference. Two SI7s, the card is just incredible. Two two or one dark iron dwarf because as i said the buff thing gets clogged up in your hand a bit although with dark iron it's not quite as bad because you can just play it at four four two harvest golem two loot hoarder are essential and zero to two novice and zero to two shiv as i said these are interchangeable it depends on personal preference how many spell damage minions are running how many buff minions are running it really does depend now the rest of the spells we've got zero to two blade flurry and zero to two fan as I said, these are interchangeable. Generally, people will run two as a combination of these four. Some people run one, some people run four. I would recommend if you're running one, I would run one blade flurry. But if you're running two, probably one of each. But it does depend on testing. I would probably not run more than, than two, but the combination is up to you. Two eviscerate, two backstab, two deadly poison, all essential removal, handles your early game, eviscerate is good all the way through the game, it's burst damage late, it deals with some large things mid game, it's just an amazing spell. And then, so, this is the weird thing about the deck, we've got between three and nine cards free. Now I'm going to be going over some of the text, but even when you go over the text and you put them all in here, you still have a couple cards free. Why is this? It's because a lot of the cards that can be run are more like sideboard cards than mainboard cards. Things like Earthen Ring Farseer possibly against Burn, Assassinate possibly against big things. There's just a lot of interesting things. I've even seen Betrayal being run in these decks. As I said, it's such a flexible deck. Anyway, so we're going to be going over the six main tech cards that are involved in these kinds of decks. So Honest and Black Knight I went over in the, the last deck, but I'm just going to reiterate them quickly. We have Sylvanas, which functions as a way of punching through some of the really large things in the game and also dealing with some of the aggro decks by providing an aggro stop. And then we have the Black Knight. Now, the Black Knight is more essential in this deck than it is in the Warlock deck. And the main reason is... Black Knight is one of two possible ways, along with Assassinate mostly, to deal with Taunt. The deck has some serious issues dealing with Taunt, and that's why the Black Knight is almost essential. It's still a tech card, because it's not essential, you can run Assassinates over it, but it is pretty close to essential. The one problem with the Black Knight, as I said, is it's dead in certain matchups, which is why in a tournament like MLG, when you can sideboard, Rogue Cantrip sort of comes up as an even better deck than it is on things like a ladder. Because you can side in or side out some of the techs which are incredibly flexible in this kind of deck. There's so many flexible sort of techs you can add to the deck that it's very difficult to predict the kind of techs that you're going to face against this kind of deck. Now the next one is the massive sort of burn and win conditions. Leroy Jenkins is used as a huge piece of burst damage it can even be used to get over taunts it's six damage straight away along with an eviscerate is a pyroblast for six mana and that can be used to get over an ancient of war as well why not just get over an ancient of war you can deal with the one months with your hero power and just get in with the rest of your minions it's very very useful very very powerful four drop mostly used to close out the game but can be used to get through some of the large stuff Edwin Van Cleef is an interesting one, which is run in some variants of the deck. Now, Edwin is more powerful the lower your curve. So things like Novice Engineer, Shiv, Backstabs, Eviscerates. I've even seen Preparation every run every so often in Cantrip decks, so that's mostly a combo card. And th those are all run with Edwin Van Cleef. Edwin Van Cleef in this kind of deck will mostly be either a 4-4, four, four, a 6-6, six, six, or an 8-8. Eight, eight. I haven't seen anything larger than that in counter decks. But some of the interesting things to see is that if you have Edwin Van Cleef, then you have a huge amount of powerful openings going second. You've got Defias Ringleader, SI7, Harvest Golem, Knife Juggler, and a 4-4 for 2 with coin, Edwin Van Cleef. Now, a 4-4 on turn 2 is incredibly difficult to deal with. It's a Millhouse Mana Storm with no downside. Just think about that. It's a Millhouse Mana Storm with no downside if you're going second. It's one of the reasons why a lot of people have been testing it. And the other reason is you can novice into this on turn 5, get a 
four four and a one one and draw a card. And late game, if you backstab something and then eviscerate it to kill it, you can play six six. It just functions really really well with the kind of combos which are sort of supported by cantrip, and that's why a lot of people have been running it. It's not essential. It's an interesting tech. People do have issues dealing with Edmund Van Cleef from time to time, and it's something I would definitely test out, especially if you have access to the card. Now, the last two cards I'm going to talk about, as far as techs go, that are actually being played a lot, are Spiteful Smith and Perdition's Blade. Now, Spiteful Smith is very good against Druid because they have some serious issues killing it on turn 5. There's almost no ways of killing it without 2 for one themselves. And then you have Perdition's Blade, which functions of Spiteful Smith and Deadly Poison and Blade Flurry. Now, the main important thing about Spiteful Smith, besides the fact that the body is very relevant against many, many matchups like Druid and Paladin, they have some serious issues dealing with this, is the Enrage effect. You can backstab your own Spiteful to get its Enrage. Something which a lot of people don't see, but you can actually backstab your own stuff or shiv your own Spiteful to get that bonus. How relevant is that bonus? It's a Deadly Poison for free. Now, if you Deadly Poison a Perdition's Blade, and you have a Spiteful that's enraged, that's a 6 damage Blade Flurry. That's a lot of damage. If you attack with it as well, or play the combo, you can do 14 burst damage and wipe your opponent's board. There's a lot of potential in Spiteful Smith. Now, Perdition's Blade is something which a lot of people have been trying out over, say, the obligatory Fan of Knives, which some people have been running. Now, the main reason for this is it does something very similar to Fan of Knives, but the effect is more concentrated on fewer minions, but more powerful. Now, if it's not comboed, it deals 1 to something, and then you attack and deals 2 to another. If it's comboed, however, it deals 2 to something, and then 2 to another. It's just a cleave that can attack again. Now, the main reason that this is so playable is because it doesn't have to be comboed. It can be comboed, but it doesn't have to be, which is very, very relevant. Now, it can be a combo starter because of this if you don't need the full comboed effect, but it also benefits off long combos from being cantripped into and things like that. The other main upside to this card is it's a weapon, which seems rather futile, but as I said, Spiteful Smith benefits it, Deadly Poison benefits it, Blade Flurry benefits it. So if you Deadly Poison with some spell damage or a Spiteful, the damage is massive. As I said, you can do 14 damage roughly, or you can go higher. You can go up to something like 20 damage if you have a, a good enough setup. But Perdition's Blade is something which I personally like a lot, and some people have been running it, but it's a bit sketchy depending on what kind of player you are. It benefits faster players, more tempo-oriented players much more than it does slow players, where Spiteful Smith is sort of the opposite. So anyway, thank you all for watching. Um, yeah, also the chat this time, it's one of the reasons why it isn't up here, is Twitch is freaking out. I couldn't really use the chat this time, because chat keeps crashing. So there's not much I can do about that. Uh, hopefully it will be fixed for next time, but uh, the Twitch chat keeps crashing. So I apologize for not having a sort of question section, but I actually can't read the chat. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's slightly awkward. Anyway, so on either Wednesday or Thursday, I'm going to be putting out the uh, other three decks, being Paladin, Giants, Druid, Beatdown, and Warrior Legendaries, and either tomorrow, on Sunday, or throughout the week, I'm going to be doing a patch review with Moon and possibly another guest. So we might have three people on that video. But anyway, thank you all for watching. If you have any feedback on sort of the, the layout, I refined it a bit. I expanded sort of the area over there. Made it slightly, slightly larger so I can actually fit a full deck in there and two different cards. Comment on the layout if you like it, because I got mostly positive feedback out of it. I wasn't expecting almost all of it to be positive. The only minor things that uh, people were kind of irritated about was the uh, ratio in between the two sections of the screen that I couldn't fit the full deck on. That was more of an experiment. I wanted to see if uh, having half the deck on at once and then talking about the other half on the next uh, slide was better. But yeah, I think I do prefer this kind of setup. But anyway, thank you all for watching. This is Jotto. Signing off.